on Friday. Okay, so we started by looking at sort of a general overview of the central nervous system. We got into the details of the peripheral nervous system. And then we further got into the, 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 the divisions of that, which were the autonomic and then somatic. And then even going further, dividing into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. We then started by speaking about the functional aspect of both of these divisions, right? The parasympathetic governing rest and digest, the sympathetic governing fight, flight, freeze. Um, and then we added the anatomy. So how the anatomy differs based upon um, that differing uh, function. And so I think we left off sort of just reviewing um, the structural components of the sympathetic nervous system. So we said that there were three routes of communication. We said that, just jumping back here to kind of review this, we said that we can go to the sympathetic chain, to an autonomic ganglia that is a part of the sympathetic chain. We said that we can synapse onto a collateral ganglia, which is an autonomic ganglia that is not a part of the sympathetic chain. And then our third route, which was really in terms of giving that diffuse, that really widespread, very fast response was synapsing onto an adrenal medulla chromaffin cell. And this cell would give us access to the bloodstream. So we would secrete the um, neurotransmitter, which would become a hormone once it enters the blood. And this would allow us to have a very widespread, very rapid, very diffuse response um, in terms of sympathetic function, okay? Um, and then we left off here talking about the mixed component of these nerves, the fact that we have this um, gray ramus fiber entering the spinal nerve, synapsing at the ganglia, and then we've got a white ramus, excuse me, I flip flop that. So we have a white ramus fiber going from the spinal cord, coming out to the ventral root, it's coming from the lateral horn, exiting by the ventral root, coming into our spinal nerve. That was the myelinated part of this nerve. And then when it synapses onto the ganglia and it re-emerges into the nerve, it is no longer myelinated. And so we refer to this as that gray ramus fiber. Okay, so that was sort of just ending off talking about the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system. So we'll pick up here and look at the anatomy of the parasympathetic nervous system. So based upon things that we illustrated last time, we know that the preganglionic neurons here are much longer. Uh, because of the location of the ganglia, the parasympathetic ganglia, they're really far away from brain and spinal cord. And so we have a really long preganglionic neuron in some instances, these are called cranial nerves, right? We're gonna talk about the, the cranial nerves that are associated with parasympathetic function um, or pelvic nerves, if we're talking about S2, S3, S4. Um, but essentially the preganglionic bit is much longer, it travels all the way out to a ganglia that is closer to the effector organ. And then there is a short postganglionic neuron that goes from that ganglia um, a shorter distance to the effector organ that is being targeted, okay? So that's kind of the, one of the obvious um, uh, differences between the, uh, the, 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 the structure in the sympathetic and the structure in the parasympathetic, the length of our two neurons. Um, the other difference was where these fibers originated from. So in the sympathetic, they originated from T1 to L2. So this central segment of the spinal cord Whereas here in the parasympathetic system, our fibers arrayed, uh, or arise excuse me, from the brainstem, cranial nerves three, seven, nine, and 10, and then the, um, the spinal nerves. So the pelvic nerves that are um, a part of S2, S3, S4. So sacral nerves two, sacral nerve three, and sacral nerve four, okay? Um, and so if we look at the different functions that are associated here, remember we're thinking about rest and digest, and that is gonna be the function of some of the, um, these cranial nerves. So we've got the vagus nerve, which is starting in the brainstem, traveling all the way. It's gonna hit a lot of different structures. Vagus is one of our longest cranial nerves. It goes all the way down through the larynx, through the, the thorax, and then all the way down to the proximal part of the gut, up to the small intestine. Um, it's gonna hit in, in that, in that um, 
in that journey, it's going to hit the pancreas, the stomach, the liver, spleen. It's going to hit the heart and it's going to hit the, um, the lungs. Okay. And as we can sort of associate, it's going to be in charge of slowing down respiratory rate, slowing down heart rate, um, that digestive component to the parasympathetic function is going to increase digestive secretions from all of our GI organs and start motility of, you know, the small intestines. Um, we've also got cranial nerve nine, the um, glossopharyngeal nerve. And glossopharyngeal, actually, no, this, the second one here is cranial nerve three, the ocular motor nerve. And this is going to the lacrimal gland of the eye specifically. That is going to help with tear secretion from the lacrimal gland. We've got cranial nerve seven, which is doing a bit of two things. It's also going to the lacrimal gland to help with tear um, production or that secretion there. But then it's also going to our salivary glands as well, specifically the submandibular gland and the sublingual glands. Okay, so submandibular and sublingual, which are two of our three salivary glands. Um, we've then got the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve nine, which is doing that third uh, salivary gland. So cranial nerve nine is going specifically to the parotid gland, which is the largest of our three salivary glands. Okay. So all in all, these four nerves are uh, responsible for the parasympathetic function from all of our body, right? From our glandular secretion in the lacrimal gland, the salivary glands. Um, our respiratory weight, heart, and then functions of the GI as well. And then at the very uh, bottom, which is S2, S3, S4, this is going to be the pelvic nerves in this region, okay? And this is different from the somatic spinal nerves. So for example, the nerves that form the, um, uh, the fibers rather that form the sciatic nerve, right? Which is going to innovate skeletal muscle that we have voluntary control over. So that's different from S2, S3, S4, which are pelvic nerves that are not under our voluntary control. This is going to things like the rectum, the distal part of the intestine, so the larger intestine, the bladder, and then the genitalia. Okay. All right. Now, looking at this mixed composition of our nerves here, um, we've got two different direction of fibers. We've got efferent fibers, starting with an E. This is fibers that's coming from the central nervous system, so from the integrating centers uh, coming down, uh, basically bringing autonomic nervous system instruction. And then we've also got afferent fibers, which are basically fibers that are going from visceral receptors, um, sending that sensory input up to those integrating centers in the brain and spinal cord. And so we kind of drew this out when we illustrated that at the beginning, but this is basically showing us that the communication is happening in both directions. Therefore, if we were to take a nerve, a spinal nerve, it's got fibers going in different directions. It's got fibers that are taking input sensory signals to the brain. It's also got fibers that are bringing down instruction, which are those efferent fibers that are uh, communicating to our various um, autonomic organs. Okay. All right. So we'll take a brief pause here and sort of digest all that we've said so far and look at these two checkpoint questions. Um, and I'll give you a minute to kind of read through these. Let's take a minute to read over these and then we'll discuss some of the answers. We'll wait another 30 or so seconds. Okay, so let's look at the first question. What, uh, sorry, which autonomic division regulates the release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla? A pretty straightforward question. Which of our two divisions regulates release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla?
Is it sympathetic? Yes, excellent. So it's a sympathetic system. This is the only division that has a route of communication to the adrenal medulla. Okay, very important distinction to make here. So the parasympathetic has no input, no relationship, no involvement with the adrenal medulla at all. Okay. Um, uh, the second question here, sorry, which part of the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic or parasympathetic, produces the more diffuse response and why? So again, which of these two divisions has the more diffuse response and why? Parasympathetic? Um, so it's not parasympathetic. Which would okay, I thought I thought it was parasympathetic because I know that goes throughout the whole body. Right, right. Yep. So um it's not the parasympathetic, but um then it would just be the, the other one, which is sympathetic. Um, and so we really want to understand why here. So the major difference is kind of going back to the first part of the question because the sympathetic system involves the adrenal medulla and we have that, uh, that access to the bloodstream, we have that ability to release neurotransmitter into the bloodstream where it becomes a hormone. This is what gives us the more diffuse response because a neurotransmitter going from one neuron to another neuron across a junction a one-to-one -one junction is not as diffuse as a neurotransmitter going into the bloodstream and moving very rapidly throughout the, the system via the circulatory um, movement, okay? Um, and so because of that third route of communication, that synapsing of a preganglionic neuron onto a chromaffin cell in the adrenal medulla, we can then access the blood and we can flood the entire system very quickly with this hormone. And so this is why the sympathetic gives us the more diffuse response. And so that's kind of a structural perspective, right? The fact that the way that these are set up and the way that they access the bloodstream, this is why it's more diffuse. The functional perspective there is because the sympathetic system needs to be more fast, right? It needs to be more of a, of a rapid response. If you're running, fighting, fleeing, Right? There's, not, there's not time to have this one-to-one, neuron-to-neuron communication. We need something that's going to rapidly move throughout the entire system, send this signal uh, everywhere quickly, and that is uh, sort of the functional reason why we have um, this anatomy that gives us a more diffuse response. In the parasympathetic system, we don't need that to be as quick, right? If you're resting and digesting, it's not a time-sensitive or, you know, time or an urgent matter, and so there doesn't need to be neurotransmitter on the parasympathetic side being dumped into the blood by a hormone, okay? So that's kind of the structural um, mechanism, but then also the functional reason behind that structural mechanism. Okay, um, let's practice another few questions here and then we'll um, look at our other objectives. So we'll launch this. Wait, last five seconds. All right. Okay, where do the nerves from the parasympathetic nervous system originate? Um, many of you selected A, um, and that is correct. So it's the brain stem and the sacral spinal cord. 
okay, brainstem and sacral spinal cord. Cervical spinal cord is gonna be the proximal part of this, the spinal cord. So that region that's in the neck, that, um, that, that area that's in the neck region, right? So that's not at all what we're looking at here. We're looking at the sacral spinal cord, which is the very distal end of the spinal cord, okay? Um, let's look at another. All right, final seconds. Okay, let's take a look. Um, what is the path of a parasympathetic signal from its point of origin? Okay, a lot of response for B, but in actuality, we have kind of a split. So half selected B and half selected other things. Um, and B is the correct answer. So um, the answer to the ganglia near the affected organ and then to the organ, okay? Um, a few persons selected D. So the parasympathetic chain, then to the ganglia located near the affected organ and then to the organ. So please bear in mind, there is no parasympathetic chain. I think I mentioned this last time, but put it in your notes, highlight it, make it very bold and very obvious in your notes. There is no parasympathetic chain. There is also no synonymous structure in the parasympathetic system, okay? The ganglia are all dispersed. They're close to the target organs. And so there's no, there's no, there's no structure that connects all of the parasymp parasympathetic ganglia because they are so dispersed that they are closer to the effector organ. And so there's no way to really connect them as such. In the sympathetic system, because they're close to the spinal cord, there's an easy route to connect all of those ganglia um, because they're in such close proximity to the sympathetic cord where they are where they are arising from. Okay, so no sympathetic, no um, parasympathetic chain, and then no synonymous structure that connects the autonomic ganglia on the parasympathetic side. Um, and so that would have made uh, D wrong, um, as well as A. And then C is wrong because we do synapse onto a ganglia. So it's not just going from brainstem to the affected organ. It does take a synapse, take a stop at that, um, that ganglia, okay? All right, so the answer here was B.